Hello one and all and welcome back to the RimWorld Eternal Winter series. We have much to do today my friends, I have plenty of construction projects for our keep in mind today, but before we get to anything like that, we have some recruiting to do. As I'm sure you all remember, last episode we ended up capturing an elven sorceress who was actually a bright mage by the name of Moinkow. Well, we've actually just recruited her into our ranks. Well, I take that back, we didn't exactly recruit her into our ranks as much as we did enslave her and begin forcing her to sweep our dining room. But hey, at least we're going to give her a pretty good life here, you know, assuming she doesn't try to rebel against us. We also finally finished up harvesting all of our new cotton plants, as you probably remember at the end or so of last episode we had a bunch of them that were blighted and we finally got a good yield this time around and we began planting more fiber corn. We would then have our new elven sorceress slave begin spinning this cotton into cloth that we could actually use for building. Once she had completed that task, we had a good bit of cloth. Now you may be wondering to yourself what I plan on using this cloth for, or you may be thinking that I actually plan on using it for clothing or something like that, and that is a good guess, but I'm actually going to be using it for bedding. Yes, so long are the days of us sleeping on solid material beds like wooden or stone or steel or iron beds or bone or any of those old uh, beds that weren't too comfortable. Now we are going to be laying on a nice cloth bed that's going to keep us nice and warm. And one of these beds was actually of legendary quality, which I was <laughs> starstruck to see. This legendary bed in question actually had art intertwined into its structure. It told the tale of Zippy herself murdering essentially a yeti at one point, which was pretty amazing. However, something that was not too amazing was the fact that we were now being raided by the Clade of Kazith, which of course are the Impids. The Impids in question that were raiding us appeared to have more upgraded gear, such as their weapons and apparel and armor and things of that sort, but not only did they have that, they also had a worm, a large dragon-like creature. A very formidable and loyal beast to the Impids, no doubt. Well, as the sun began to rise, they began their assault against our keep and of course we began firing at them from the embrasures in our tower. Now somebody did tell me that I need to get rid of these rocks here because enemies are using them as cover and this is a good example of why I should do that. We began retreating to our other tower while the worm and impids began hitting our traps and whatnot. We tried using the bright mage slaves uh, abilities against them and this somewhat worked but not exactly. Thankfully though, as we were taking down the impids on the outside, our polar bear and bright mage were taking down the worm on the inside of the towers and eventually they did kill it. But with most of our attackers downed or slain, it was time for the remaining impid to begin a retreat. Now you only saw two impids in the worm, you may be wondering where the third is. Well funny enough, this mad lad had apparently not dressed for the park coming into our northern territories and began succumbing to frostbite and he was eventually downed. By it, so I suppose that mother nature did the hard part for us and now it was up to us to finish the job. Now while it may seem a bit silly that the impid hadn't dressed for the weather, you must remember that the southern hemisphere of this planet is mostly boreal forest, so it is much warmer down there than it is up here. I want to take a moment as well and just brag on our polar bear who almost single handedly took down this mystical worm creature all by himself. He did take one hell of a beating, but thankfully he's being tinted to and he should be just fine and plus now we have a mystical worm creature to cut up into bits and turn into stew. So now we get mystical worm stew and our bear proved himself in battle, a win-win situation. And since our bear didn't die during this battle I thought it may be the perfect time to go ahead and name him of course and of course also I asked you guys last episode for names for the bear and I have decided to go with Snow White. This name is based on a comment by our good friend Cybeck5024 who said that we should call the polar bear Snow White because he might be male and a 800 kilogram carnivore uh, that is just waiting for an opportunity to eat you but he is still our little princess and I just, I really love that. That is the perfect name so thank you very much. But now that the bear naming is out of the way, it's time for us to do a little bit of research. Now something I would like to begin researching 
cooking is some food technology. In particular, I would like to research some stews that we can cook and things of that sort. And so, of course, Lim immediately began looking into the stew cooking technologies. And this is actually based on a comment by our good friend Nandeyo Blob <laughs> 7004. Sorry if I butchered your name. Uh, but you were saying that, uh, you know, not sure if I already know this. I didn't. Uh, but if we're struggling with food, we can actually use bone for a bone soup, which is going to be amazing because we are always struggling with food, it seems. We did eventually get the research researched for stoop technologies, as it were, and we built a great big stew pot, which I immediately began setting up to make some bone stews, so we always kind of just keep those in stock. Since our food storage room is always in freezing temperatures, it can't hurt to keep a good supply of this bone soup out there. That way, if we run out of our normal meals and whatnot, we'll always have the soup. During the time that we were researching all of this, though, as it did take quite a while and it took my attention away from other things going on at the keep, apparently our connected Gorlin tree was destroyed in some way, shape, or form. I tried to read on it and see, but it doesn't show as to what happened. I thought it could possibly be due to the temperature, but I read online that apparently that's not possible, and let's, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, regardless, Rosh was very tore up about the whole situation, and as was I, I really loved our little dryads, and they were also our main source of timber. But obviously, of course, we do have our fiber corn farm, and we also have a good stockpile of timber for the time being. I'll try to keep an eye out for any more of the um, Gorlin seeds and things like that, so we can try to replant and try to have more dryads, unfortunately. But for the time being, we're going to have to continue working on our keep, which also means working on our defenses. Something else that we began working on was gathering up steel for a little expansion onto our farm. Of course, now that the dryads are gone, we want to try and increase our fiber corn production, so we're going to need to make more glass for skylights, and of course for that we need steel. Now, steel is a very finite resource on this planet, and for the time being, the really only reliable way for us to get steel is by destroying these metallic structures and things like that of old and melting the slag chunks down into ingots. So obviously, as you can imagine, I sent people out, we began destroying these structures, taking all these slag chunks all the way back home, and we immediately began trying to melt them down into ingots that we could actually use for our glass. And yes, as you can see, it was a very long and drawn out process. I'm pretty sure through the research trees with Medieval Overhaul, there are ways of making steel ingots. Uh, as steel is an alloy, uh, you know, you could go through the smithing and metallurgy uh, research, but of course, I'm a bit lazy and that would take a very long time, so I decided to go this route. And though, as I mentioned, it did take quite a while for us to actually gather up the steel to make the glass for the skylights, building the expansion onto our farm and building the skylights and everything didn't take near as long. I believe for the time being, I'm going to maybe split these, so half the farm into fiber corn, or at least over half, and then the rest of it into food for us. Of course, going with rice for the time being, because it doesn't take very long to grow at all, so it would be perfect for a quick and easy meal. But it was around about at this point that I felt like we weren't really making all that much progress in the keep in this episode, unfortunately, even though we had been going for quite a long time. So I wanted to kind of start upgrading our gear and maybe start on some of those bigger construction projects that I was talking about earlier. To begin with the gear upgrades, I noticed that Rasha's pneumatic rifle was still pretty weak. <laughs> Not that it was going to get any stronger, but he needed something uh, that could actually compete with better weapons, so I decided to actually build him a proper rifle. Not anything too outlandish, but a flintlock rifle, something that's still kind of with the era and time. I know not everyone really likes that I have guns in this series, but I mean, they're very rudimentary weapons, flintlock weaponry, pneumatic rifles, I mean, it's it's nothing, you know, we're not using assault rifles or anything like that. It's a very medieval-ish <laughs> series. But regardless though, Rosh did end up finishing off this rifle, and it was of poor quality, unfortunately, but the damage output was much better than his pneumatic rifle, which was of awful quality, so it was still quite the upgrade. 
But I think I'll leave it at that for the time being for upgrading weapons and armor as I have quite the hankering for some construction. Now I think what we're going to begin building here is a throne room. If we're going to truly be some type of medieval dynasty or kingdom or something of that sort at some point, we are going to need a throne room somewhere where we can make decisions and our leader can actually, you know, spend time. So we ended up digging out a very large section of the mountain and we built a beautiful limestone throne for Rosh to sit upon. And now of course this is a meditation throne so it will always say unowned unfortunately. I can't assign it to Rosh and I believe unless he has some type of psi casting abilities which at some point we may end up getting him but for the time being we're just going to have to put up with that as he sits on it. But this truly is the beginning of something beautiful for not only will Rosh sit upon this throne making decisions and whatnot, but so will his descendants. Of course, obviously though, I'm not going to leave the throne room there as we have a lot more work to do, such as adding in some beautiful stone flooring. Unfortunately though, we really only have limestone and granite to choose from, so the flooring is going to match the walls a little bit. Maybe eventually we'll have some slate or something that we can throw in there and just kind of make the colors pop a little bit better. You know, a good difference between the walls and the floors and other items in the throne room. Of course though, every good throne room needs a good study to go along with it so we began digging out a section of the hill to put something like a mini library slash study in as well where they could plan out attacks on other factions or just basically study the text of old but of course none of this is official unless we do an official ceremony here in the new throne room appointing Rosh as our leader so that's exactly what we decided to do not only does this make him the leader of our keep and dynasty but this will also give him the combat command and other wonderful purposes of being the official leader of the colony. And things like that can definitely make or break a fight, especially when we're getting raided by impids that have giant worm creatures and things like that. Of course, it's going to help to have really any advantage on them that we can take. Of course, though, with that being said, our throne room and study are not exactly completed. There's still a lot of things I would like to add, such as some log benches and whatnot for all of our subjects to sit on while listening to Rosh talk in the throne room. So we're going to need plenty of logs and timber and things for the throne room and study uh, but to go about doing that we're going to need to deconstruct some of these ancient medieval structures for their resources so that's exactly what we did and obviously of course we are somewhat limited in the resources that we currently have we're having to use logs and timber we don't exactly have any elven timber or anything like that which is very beautiful we don't have any uh, other types of cloth other than like cotton cloth or rawhide to build our drapes so it's not exactly gorgeous, but it'll do for now, I think. At some point during our massive construction projects, though, young baby Snowdrop has grown from a baby into a child, so she can actually do hauling and cleaning, and best of all, of course, she can finally walk around. So that was pretty great. She can actually start pulling her weight around the keep. We're going to actually make her begin cleaning the throne room as well as basically everything else. I would, however, once again begin working on the keep as we would start mining out a section for a bedroom. Unfortunately though, this would be interrupted. We apparently had a faction assault in our territory, the Grey River Pact and the Purple Mire Pact. There's so many packs on this planet, sometimes it's a bit hard to keep up, but the main takeaway here is we have an elf that is obviously from the Elven Empire dynasty, whatever you know you want to say, and we also have someone who's from another dynasty with a big ass blunderbuss. And the two of them are about to begin cracking each other's heads wide open of course. Now, I normally would just let them fight it out on their own, and we did end up kind of doing that here, but I thought it might be a good opportunity to kind of step in and maybe try and stop the fighting by taking them both down, and then we would imprison both of them, so that's exactly what we decided to do. We ended up capturing both of them and taking them back to our fairly newish prison. I mean, we built the darn thing, we might as well use it. Both of these two ended up being some pretty good candidates for our our dynasty here. 
Obviously though, their traits and skills and things like that are going to be completely meaningless if they bleed out on our nice little beds here in the prison, so we begin tending to them. After a while though, that was finally completed, and as you can see, the elf was one hell of a fighter with a really good shooting skill, really good at mining animals, even a pretty good intellectual skill, and just fairly decent all around with their other skills. And as for our human prisoner, she also wasn't too bad herself. Now she was a misan which means that she hates men and she is also very delicate so she's not going to be great in fighting but she is one hell of a miner as well as one hell of a grower so she's going to be perfect for our uh, indoor farm and things like that but now with that little kerfuffle finally over with we could continue our extensive work in our brand new throne room well the study attached to the throne room as well as a bedroom specifically made for the king and queen at least for the time being I am going to refer to Rosh as our king. He, of course, is our leader, but I don't really know if I like that title. I, you know, I would like something more like uh, Emperor or something like that. If you guys have suggestions for what we could call Rosh and Zippy's roles here in the dynasty, please uh, leave them in the comment section. If I see any that really catch my eye, we'll most definitely end up going with that. But it would appear that the bedroom is finally finished, and it does appear to have the approval of Zippy as well as Snowdrop. For a good bit of time, we would mainly put our focus into attempting to recruit the two people that we had captured, the first of which to join us was the human named Robin, and then of course we would begin trying to focus more on the elf as they were the only one left. Eventually, of course, they too would end up joining us. Now, Robin immediately began to Doing some research in our brand new study which was perfect because when there wasn't any growing or anything like that to do of course Robin could begin working on new technologies for us especially while Lim was busy with other things unfortunately however Robin's research would be interrupted by our slave attempting to escape Moin cow was in the warehouse and I suppose she thought it the perfect time to try and run away luckily for us Zippy Rosh and Irene all rushed in to beat her to a pulp stopping her little escape before it could really even get started. Now that that was over with, of course, we would take her back to her bed and begin tending to her, but this did make me realize that Rosh's hat must have worn out over time, and I hadn't even noticed it, so he put on this very ugly yellow hood. It's not a too ugly of a hood, but it doesn't exactly go with his outfit, so I decided that I wanted to build him something else. We ended up having Irene use the best steel that we had at our disposal to actually build Rosh a proper helmet for battle. Now, I do plan on building building him an actual hat, another tricorn hat as it were, but for now I want to see how these helmets look on him. This helmet is actually from our research into the medieval overhaul armor sets instead of the more medieval helms and whatnot armors. And I must say that I was pretty pleased with how it turned out. I think as we continue to advance our medieval dynasty here, of course, we'll continue to advance our armors as well. So this is a pretty wonderful starter armor. Eventually, I'd also like to try and work on some hooded helmets as well. While we're on the topic of upgrading our keep, of course, we began making some new quilted beds, end tables, and dressers in Rosh and Zippy's old room. We're going to be turning it into something of a barracks, I believe, for our newest recruits, of course. I'm not sure if I want to leave it as a barracks or maybe split it off into some separate rooms or something. I know normally there is a bit of a debuff just having to sleep in the same room in a barracks together, so we may eventually turn this into separate rooms, or eventually we may also end up using it as part of our storage room. But for the time being, Peub and Robin will be lying their weary heads here at night. But now for some more wholesome content. We had Rosh begin making a short bow for Snowdrop. Her very first short bow made by her very own father and he would actually end up taking her out and letting her do a little bit of target shooting. Obviously, of course, it's going to be very vital that Snowdrop is taught to defend herself. Not only is she a vulnerable child, but she is, as the firstborn child of Rosh and Zippy, the heir to this dynasty. For a good target, I thought that this ancient vehicle would suffice, as it's extremely large and hard to miss, of course, but also because we're going to eventually 
eventually deconstruct it for steel. And then after that, I finally got around to making Rosh a brand new tricorn hat. I'm not sure exactly what the previous one was made out of, but this one is made out of cloth, and unfortunately it ended up looking quite a bit darker, but you know, it's, uh, it, it's better than nothing, I suppose. It is definitely better than his helmet as well. Could you imagine how cold that helmet would be on your head and on your ears in a place like this? Regardless though, we are going to keep the helmet for battles and things like that, of course. We'll just keep it in Rasha's inventory when he needs it. But then I began thinking to myself, you know, what is a medieval keep, a medieval dynasty, if we don't have any beautiful rugs to decorate our halls? So we ended up building a tailoring station that was specifically created for rugs. And now, of course, this is from the area rugs mod. I have also, of course, added this mod to the mod list in the video description as well. Now, if you're unfamiliar with this mod, you may see the animal skin rugs and just think that that's really all it has to offer, but my friends, it is not. My favorite rugs from this mod are the runner rugs, which we're actually going to be using in our throne room. Unfortunately, they are going to be made of rawhide to match the curtains or drapes that we have in there, but like I mentioned, later on we'll eventually most likely end up upgrading these. Thanks to these rugs, as well as many other additions, of course, to the throne room, it is now very impressive, somewhat rich. It was obviously very spacious, of course, but it is also pretty. Some time after finishing up the throne room, though, we began working on our indoor farm. We harvested what fiber corn we had and began planting rice and flax. Now, flax is something similar to cotton. Not exactly, of course, but in terms of Rimworld, it is as you can turn it into something of a cloth-like material. Now, this cloth-like material, of course, is called linen, and linen is something that we need for several different types of recreational facilities that can be built throughout the medieval overhaul mod. Unfortunately, though, not too long after, we ended up having a siege from the House Oswin, and there was actually a relationship with one of the race the raider in question here is Spiesi, I believe is how you pronounce it. They were the nephew of Rosh and cousin of Snowdrop, which means that Rosh does indeed have siblings elsewhere on this planet. Perhaps Rosh is actually some type of descendant of another medieval dynasty, or perhaps he's just a nobody that is forming his own medieval dynasty and his family members are a part of other houses, other kingdoms, and things like that, of course. But for now, we do have to worry about about this siege as they are preparing to actually just beat the dog shit out of us with uh, mortar rounds and anything else they can get their hands on. It would also appear that they have a very powerful sorceress with them, which at this point is becoming standard procedure for intense raids. Unfortunately though, this large siege will need to wait until next episode, for we have something to go over. I asked you guys at the end of the last episode if you'd like to begin providing some lore for the world or just basically anything throughout this series, and you guys did not let me down, of course, so we have some of that to go over. So, to begin, we have a comment by our friend Hoppy78, the Bean Guy 46 who says the Eternal Winter is due to some sort of curse from an extremely powerful Psycaster slash mage, or the world disrespected the Empire, which then plunged the world into a technological dark age and then used a huge climate controller to push the inhabitants further into an Eternal Winter. So we have some really good ideas there, and then we also have Ryan Rios 4328, who added on to that by saying that the cold world basically is very far away from the sun, not getting a lot of heat. Now, I'm going to say that I do like a mixture of both of those comments, and they are also going to be mixed in along with a comment by Azer T. Moyle Oi. I'm sorry, I can't pronounce names, but they state that the history of the world is that a nuclear fallout um, caused people to mutate along with some animals. It could also explain the infinite winter and the strange beast, and also the fact that there is some sort of early renaissance era. So perhaps long, long ago, in what would now be considered ancient times, the empire of this planet had gotten into some type of war, something along those lines, um, and because the planet is so far away from the sun and already experiencing issues with heat, a nuclear war, something to that effect, actually caused the process to accelerate exponentially. Initially. Because of this, the Empire rounded up all their noble people and basically just the people that they felt were worth saving and they actually fled the planet, expecting everyone that was left behind to basically freeze to death. 
But they didn't, and they survived, and after many, many years and their technology somewhat coming back to what we would call a renaissance period, basically bringing us to where we are now. And now, of course, the nuclear winter is somewhat wearing off or has almost completely wore off, and that's why the southern hemisphere of the planet is actually warming up some, and we see more boreal forest to the south, and we see a lot of ice sheet and tundra to the north. And now, with all of that being said, there is still the fact that there could possibly be a faction, one of the medieval factions that we see here, who are actually trying to keep this frozen hellscape across the entire planet by using sorcery. Is there a main sorcerer or mage that's causing this? We don't know just yet, but we do intend on finding out. But that is all I have for you guys today in terms of lore. If you guys want to leave some comments about more lore for the planet, the characters, stuff like that, be sure to leave that in the comment section down below. But I hope you guys have enjoyed. I love you ever so much. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.